After helping to organize the first U.S. colored troops, Henry McNeil Turner became a delegate to the State Constitutional Convention in Atlanta and was elected as a representative to the Georgia State Legislature in 1868. Soon after, though, he was among two dozen legislators who were expelled for the crime of being black. Here is an excerpt of his address to his fellow legislators denouncing the expulsions. I wish the members of this house to understand the position I take. I hold that I am a member of this body. Therefore, sir, I shall neither fawn nor cringe before any party, nor stoop to beg them for my rights. Some of my colored fellow members in the course of their remarks took occasion to appeal to, to the sympathies of members on the opposite side and to eulogize their character. It reminds me very much, sir, of slaves begging under the lash. I am here to demand my rights and to hurl thunderbolts at the men who would dare to cross the threshold of my manhood. There's an old aphorism which says, fight the devil with fire. And if I should observe the rule in this instance, I wish gentlemen to understand that it is but fighting them with their own weapon. The scene presented at this house today is one unparalleled in the history of the world. Never in the history of the world has a man been arraigned before a body clothed with legislative judicial and executive functions charged with the offense of being of a darker hue than his fellow men. Cases may be found where men have been deprived of their rights for crimes and misdemeanors, but it has remained for the state of Georgia in the very heart of the 19th century to call a man before the bar and there charge him with an act for which he is no more responsible than the head which he carries upon his shoulders. The Anglo-Saxon race, sir, is, is the most surprising one. No man has ever been more deceived in that race than I have been for the past three weeks. I was not aware that there was in the character of that race so much cowardice, the treachery which has been exhibited in it by gentlemen belonging to that race has shaken my confidence in it more than anything that has come under my observation from the day of my birth. I tell you, sir, that this is a question which will not die today. This event shall be remembered by posterity for ages yet to come and while the sun shall continue to climb the hills to, of heaven. I wish very much in the, in the position, I stand very much in the position of a criminal before your bar because I dare to be the exponent of the views of those who sent me here. Or in other words, we are told that if black men want to speak, they must speak through white trumpets. If black men want their sentiments expressed, they must be adulterated and sent through white messages who will quibble, equivocate, and evade as rapidly as the pendulum on a clock. If this is, if this be not done, then the black men have committed an outrage and their representatives must be denied the right to represent their constituents. The great question, sir, is this, am I a man? If I am such, I claim the rights of a man. Am I not a man because I happen to be of the darker hue than honorable gentlemen around me? Why, sir, though we are not white, we have accomplished much. We have pioneered civilization here. We have built up your country. We have worked your fields and garnered your harvests for 250 years. And what do we ask of you in return? Do we ask you for compensation for the sweat of our fathers bore for you, for the tears you have caused and the hearts you have broken and the lives you have curtailed and the blood you have spilt? 
Do we ask retaliation? We ask not. We are willing to let the dead pass bury the dead. But we ask you now for our rights. You have all the elements of superiority upon your side. You have our money and your own. You have our education and your own. And you have your land and our own too. We who numbered hundreds of thousands in Georgia, including our wives and families, have not a foot of land to call our own. We are strangers in the land of our birth, without money, without education, without aid, without a roof to cover our, us while we are alive, or sufficient clay to cover us when we die. It is extraordinary that a race such as yours, professing education, superiority, living in a land where ringing chimes called child and sire to the church of God, a land where Bibles are read and gospel truths are spoken, and where courts of justice are presumed to exist. It is extraordinary, I say, that with all these advantages on your side, you can make war upon the poor defenseless black man. <laughs> 